Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our eighth session on the tafsir of Surah Fatir. I apologize for the uh, the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I pray that we're able to to move forward without any uh, any further uh, cancellations. Uh, just you know, a, a quick uh, overview before we begin. Uh, we were left off at verse uh, nineteen, but just for the sake of context, uh, Surah Fatir is the thirty fifth surah of the Quran in its in its sequence. But chronologically, as we had indicated in our earlier sessions, uh, Surah Fatir, according to the, the dominant view among the Mufassirin, Surah Fatir is a middle Meccan period surah. And this is precisely the, the time in the early history of Islam where the Prophet's movement in Mecca is gaining momentum, it's gaining followers, and naturally, uh, Islam and the Muslims are, you know, they were initially considered to be a, a nuisance, but now there is uh, there is great fear in the hearts of the aristocrats, the ruling class of Mecca, that this that this uh, this religious revolution uh, is growing into something that is difficult uh, to contain, and therefore at this time. You see that as the momentum, as the prophet grows in numbers and in influence, uh, you see that there's proportionately there's this resistance that emerges, and there's violence and uh, hostility that's being directed towards uh, towards the uh, the early Muslims, the, the Muslims who are uh, who are in Mecca, and you find that in this surah, of course, the surah begins with the praise of Allah and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a, an invisible system of guidance, an invisible kingdom uh, that we're not familiar with, that we don't know very much about, uh, which is the, the world of angels. Uh, we only know about them through uh, revelation. So Allah has created this robust system of guidance. And there's this interaction between the unseen world and the the apparent world and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about about faith and the ultimate end of those who who have faith who connect to their creator who live moral lives and Allah speaks about the the consequences the very serious consequences of uh, knowing the truth but choosing to reject it choosing to turn a blind eye to reality uh, refusing to abide by the the sacred law, which is uh, which is the Sharia, ah. and Allah speaks about the consequences of of those choices. You know, after all, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created human beings as free agents, and you have been granted, you have been endowed with this ability to choose to choose your course, but every choice has. Uh, ramifications, it has consequences, it has ultimate uh, outcomes. And you see that in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compares and contrasts the realities of, uh, of faith and disbelief. And we saw that uh, in our previous uh, session where Allah speaks about uh, the, the bodies of water, you know, the, the fresh water and the salt water and, uh, and the differences between them as a, uh, as a metaphor for the differences between faith and, uh, and disbelief. We reached verse number 19 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَسْتَوِ الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرُ The blind and the seeing are not alike. Now, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not comparing, you know, those who have the ability to see with, with those who have, who have, a, you know, visual impairments. Uh, as, as you could obviously, as, as you could probably guess, seeing 
is used as a metaphor for belief, and this is a common theme in the Quran, the idea that those who believe, those who have connected and surrendered and submitted to their creator and who live their lives in accordance with divine law, they are endowed with this ability to perceive the truth. So seeing is used as a metaphor for belief and blindness is a metaphor, is understood as a metaphor for, for disbelief. Now, this type of blindness that the Quran speaks of is, is more serious, of course, and it's more detrimental than physical blindness. Because in, in, in most cases, if not all, physical blindness is not a choice. You know, people are born with, uh, with certain visual impairments or you know, uh, gradually they lose their eyesight. But spiritual blindness is a self-imposed blindness. It's the refusal to see. It's the refusal to objectively consider uh, the possibilities of, of a metaphysical world. It's the refusal to accept the possibility that there may be a creator given the complexity of the, of the order of the way that the universe is organized. So it's this unwillingness to, to see the truth. When you look at the Quran, you find that there is, there is a, a strong relationship between the way that we conduct ourselves in this earthly life and the way that is manifested in the hereafter. And what I mean by that is that if we say that when the Quran speaks about seeing and, and blindness, it's speaking about the, the eye of the heart, spiritual sight, which, which, what we, which, which is something that we could call insight, and blindness, spiritual blindness. One of the unique features of the hereafter is that in the hereafter, the internal realities of people become their external realities. You know, in dunya, a lot of who we are is concealed. Right? You, know, you, you know, everyone looks human. Everyone has a shared humanity with respect to their, their physical reality. However, in the hereafter, our essence will surface. Our essence will become the external and the apparent. And therefore, a person who imposes this, this spiritual blindness on themselves the spiritually blind will be resurrected as, as those who are blind in the, in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and conversely, there may be someone who is physically blind, but they, are spiritual, they have spiritual sight, they have spiritual insight. And in the akhirah, they will be resurrected as, as, as being able to see with the ability of sight. Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي هَذِهِ أَعْمَى فَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَعْمَى وَأَضَلُّ سَبِيلًا And whoever is blind in this life, whoever is spiritually blind, whoever, you know, for whatever reason, you know, because of arrogance, because of, you know, uh, irrational skepticism, whatever it may be, if the heart is blind in dunya, that blindness will be pronounced and manifested in the hereafter. Because who we are, the core, the essence of who we are is spiritual. And I've, I've mentioned this many times. You know, we don't, it's not that, and there's a, there's a, a quotation that, uh, and the gist of it is that we don't, we human beings don't have souls. We don't have souls. 
Human beings are souls. They have bodies. So what we possess is a body. And the body is, is a vehicle. It's something temporary and we die. It, it decomposes, it disintegrates, and we continue to live. What continues after the physical body uh, falls apart and dies? It's the soul. And because there are less restrictions, there are less limitations in alam al-akhirah, the, the soul, the reality of the soul is much more pronounced. And therefore, that spiritual blindness that was easy to conceal in dunya becomes a, a prominent attribute in the hereafter because the soul is, is much more free to express itself in, uh, in alam al-akhirah. وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي هَذِي أَعْمَى فَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَعْمَى وَأَضَلُّ سَبِيلًا and, and this verse reminds me of, uh, of an exchange between a... Uh, I, I don't remember who the scholar was. I mean, either it was Sayyid, uh, Sayyid Sharaf al-Din, the author of Muraja'at, or Ayatollah Narashi. I can't remember who it was. But in any case, there was a conversation between a Shi'i scholar and a, uh, a, Salaf, a Salafi scholar who subscribed to a literal interpretation of the Qur'an. And these are, you know, this is a strand of Islam that does not believe in, uh, in using reason to understand uh, the Qur'an, especially with respect to the, the allegorical verses that speak about God. So, for example, when the Quran says "Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa," that God mounts His throne, Ahlul Hadith historically, the, the the traditionalists in the Sunni tradition would argue that it literally means God mounts His throne. We don't know. We we don't we know what we know what we know what istiwa means, but we don't know the kafiya. You know. So al-istiwa ma'lum, they say we, un we understand what the word mountings means, but we don't know the reality, what it means for God to sit on his throne. And it's, it's an innovation to even ask. Now, when this Shi'i scholar met uh, a Salafi scholar who, who was of that school, and that Salafi scholar happened to be blind, so the Shi'i scholar said to him that based on your methodology, based on your approach, your interpretive approach to the Qur'an, you're going to be resurrected on the Day of Judgment blind because you were physically, you were literally blind in dunya and therefore based on your literalist understanding of the Qur'an, I have bad news for you. You're going to be also blind uh, in the hereafter. Now, again, in any case, going back to our initial point, the qualities, the traits of the soul become manifest in, uh, in Alam Al-Akhirah. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that on the Day of Judgment, at the very least, we are resurrected in human form. You know, some of us, our, our souls are so wicked and we've deviated from, from basic human decency that, you know, we have a hadith about how certain people will be resurrected in the form of certain animals because their souls have become entirely animalistic and they've, they've, they've eroded uh, their, their humanity. So they'll, their form in the hereafter will be a reflection of uh, their souls. In another verse in Surah uh, Al Hajj, verse 46, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارِ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ For indeed, it is not eyes that are blinded. Now, of course, literally there are people who are blind, but the the, the message of this verse is that True blindness, the blindness that you really need to worry about, 
the blindness that has, that can have, that can potentially have eternal ramifications is the blindness of the heart. You know, those who are physically blind, you know, this is just a temporary physical uh, a disability. But spiritual blindness, even though you can physically see the, uh, the consequences and the, the dangers and the harms of that are incomprehensible to us. So, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ The most dangerous type of blindness is the blindness of the hearts. And hearts don't become blind overnight, brothers and sisters. Blindness, the heart becomes blind when it persistently refuses to surrender to the truth. When it develops an arrogance and a, a, it develops this rebellious nature and it's rooted in arrogance and love of the material world and the, the unwillingness to surrender to a higher authority, to a higher power. Uh, so this is the blindness that we should be very uh, wary of. And of course, this... This blindness really uh, develops when someone is exposed to the truth and they refuse. Many people, so you, we can't just assume that, oh, if someone is not Muslim, they are spiritually blind. No, on, on, the, on the contrary, there are many people who simply have not been introduced to the Islam of Ahlul Bayt. And I emphasize the Islam that was taught by the Prophet, the Islam that was taught by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the Islam of Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha, where he says, Law alimun nas kalamina tabauna, that if people were acquainted, if people only knew the, the beauty of our words, they would follow us. You know, so so this is the type of rejection, the rejection of that pure, unadulterated, the divine message in its purest form. When that is rejected, when someone rejects the Islam that is articulated by the Prophet, when someone re rejects the Islam that is taught by the Ahlul Bayt, by the Imams, those who reject the Islam that is perfectly presented to them, and they continuously refuse and uh, they arrogantly turn away, that will result in the blindness of the heart. <clears throat> now, there's a verse in Surat Al-Anfal, and this is a very powerful verse, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the secret on how to, to obtain, how to gain the ability to discern between truth and falsehood on an individual level allah says ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in tattaqullah yaj'al lakum furqana o you who believe if you are conscious of god if you have taqwa now what does this mean what does it mean to be conscious of god you know a very simple definition of taqwa is to fulfill your obligations before Allah and to refrain from that which Allah has forbidden. That's really the, the, the essence of taqwa. The essence of taqwa is to obey God. If you obey God, if you do what he has commanded and you stay away and you refrain from what the sacred law has banned, has prohibited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will endow you with a sort of intuition, with a sort of an internal, and a sort of insight that Allah will give you basira. He will give you that furqan. You know, the Quran is described as furqan. The Torah is described as furqan because it, 
It differentiates between what is true and what is false, between what is fake and what is real. But if you want to have that, that intuition, and that's why, you know, we have many a hadith where the prophet, he, he warns people of trying to deceive mu'mineen. اتقوا فراسة المؤمن Beware of the insight. Beware of the cleverness of a believer. فَإِنَّهُ يَنْظُرُ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ Because the believer sees through the light of God. This is what Allah is speaking about here. That if you have taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will endow you with this internal furqan, with this intuition. You know, even when people try to deceive you and manipulate you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the truth clear in your eyes. He will, he will give you this ability, this insight. So God grants pious people insight or intuition, whatever word you want to use, which allows them to differentiate between what is false and what is true. So they're able to see the reality while others are unable to discern. So verse number 19, those who are blind are not like those who have who have the ability to see. The blind are not like those, the spiritually blind cannot even be compared to those who have been endowed with this spiritual sight, with this spiritual insight. Nor the darkness and the light. Darkness cannot be compared to light. Again, Allah is showing us the, the contrast between Iman and Kufr. And it's illustrated to us through concepts, through realities that are very familiar to us. Everyone knows what darkness is and what light is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And being in complete darkness, you know, if, if you're standing in a room that is completely dark, it's terrifying. It's paralyzing. Because you don't know, you have no knowledge of the environment around you. If it's pitch black, if there's not a single photon of light, you're completely paralyzed. You don't, you don't even know if there's a wall in front of you. You're in, you're, you're in danger. It's a very dangerous circumstance to find you in. Darkness cannot be compared to light. In fact, if you were put in a dark room for an extended period of time, it would do a great deal of damage to your emotional and your mental health. But light, it's in our nature to gravitate towards light. Light is the, the source of life. So in the same way that light is a life-giving source, even in the material world, faith, iman, is, it gives life. It gives life to the heart, gives life to the soul. And notice that the darkness, and we see this throughout the Quran, darkness is, it, it, we see it in, in, in the plural form. It's not zulma, it's zulumat. Darkness is plural. But light is, is singular. And that's the beauty of truth. There, there's only one truth. Because we believe in an, in an objective reality. But darkness, you know, you, when you have, you know, an exam, and, and, there's what, and there's one right answer, you can have tens of wrong answers. The truth is, is singular. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we, and we covered this, uh, this verse when we... Uh, when we reflected and we discussed Surah Al-An'am, the verse where Allah says, وَجَعَلَ الظُّلُمَاتِ وَالنُّورِ Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and He, 
He made darkness and light. You know, these verses that speak about Zulumat and Nur, there are many verses in the Quran that, that speak about light and darkness. And these verses generated a great deal of debate and conversation among Muslim scholars of, of the past and even the present. And the concept of light and darkness is such a prevalent theme in the Quran that you find that it even led to the formation of an entire philosophical school of thought. I've mentioned this, uh, this philosopher before. And again, when I mention any particular philosopher, I'm not, it's not an endorsement of every belief they've ever expressed. It's just, you know, it's important for us to at least be familiar with the, uh, the different views and the different theories that have been put forward. Shihabuddin al-Sahruwardi, uh, who died in 1191, uh, he's the founder of the, Illuminish, the Illuminationist school of philosophy. And he basically argued that the creation of God, that al-khalq, creation itself, is a hierarchy. And the beings that are in closest proximity to God possess the most spiritual light. And light here, it seems to mean, seems to be a reference to the the intensity of their existence, perhaps. So if you have, if you think of his model as a pyramid, you have God who is the, the absolute, the eternal, uncreated light that is the light that cannot be compared to any light. And then below God, you have the prophet, you know, awwalu ma khalaq Allahu nuri, as the... Uh, as the hadith says, the, the prophet says, the first thing that God created was my light. And therefore, the closer a being is or a creature is in proximity to God, the more nur it possesses. And the further away from God, the less light that being possesses. And everything that has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses an inherent degree of light and there is no being that is absolutely dark because every creature of god by virtue of, of its existence possesses a degree of light even shaitan and the light that allah gives to to inanimate objects for example it's fixed the light that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the light that he has assigned to angels is it's fixed. The only beings that can fluctuate, that can move up this hierarchy or move down, move down are beings that have been endowed with free will. And that, namely, jinn and human beings. We can either increase the nur that is in our beings, or we can decrease the light that exists in our beings. So, and we're all born, we're all born with an initial light, which is the light of the fitra. And through correct beliefs, through good deeds, we can increase that light or we can decrease that light. If someone is arrogant and they reject the truth and they commit sin and they commit wicked acts, that light decreases. So the, the goal of Islamic spirituality is to increase the luminosity of the human soul and ascend higher in, uh, in the hierarchy of, uh, of God's creation. This verse is a famous verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, and it's often mentioned in these discussions on 
on light and darkness. The ayah says, Allah waliyu ladina amanu. Yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumat ila al-nur. Walladina kafaru, awliyauhum al-taghut. Yukhrijunahum min al-nur ila al-dhulumat. Allah is the wali. He is the guardian of those who believe. Now, of course, Allah is the guardian of, of everyone, of all creation. But those who believe have embraced, they have accepted, they have willingly accepted divine guardianship. They have accepted God as their guardian, as the one who guides them, the one who provides them with a, a moral code, a sacred law. He brings those who accept Allah's wilaya, he brings them out of the darkness into the light. So you see these notions, these concepts of, of light and darkness. And then Allah says, and as to those who disbelieve, their guardians are the false deities. They turn to other than God for, for fulfillment, for you know, prosperity, for success. Those false deities who take them out of the light and into the darkness. Now the question here is, when Allah speaks about believers, He speaks about taking them out of darkness into light. But when Allah speaks about kuffar, He says that they were taken out of light into darkness. Now the, now the question is, what light did the kuffar possess that they were taken out of it? This is a reference to the light of fitrah the light of their, their primordial nature, because we believe that all human beings are created innocent. They're, they're, they, have, they have this inborn decency that, that can be cultivated, that can be nurtured. And when Allah speaks about mu'minin, He says He can take them out of darkness into light. It's all degrees of light. Now, when you move higher in your spirituality, the, the stations that you occupied previously, it's, it, it's, it's, it's comparatively, it is darkness. You know, a very simple example that we can give is that if it's a very bright, sunny day and you're, at, and you're inside the house, there's a light inside your house. Let's assume that you have some lamps and there's also light outside. It's a bright, sunny day. Comparatively, the inside of your house is dark if it's compared to the light that is outside. But they're, they both possess light. But darkness is, is used as, as, uh, as relative. It's relatively dark compared to the the brilliant, blinding light that is outside. So as we move closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the higher degrees of spiritual ex uh, excellence are so bright and so illuminating that relative to those high degrees, the lower levels are darkness. So for example, someone who performs all of the nawafil and all of the, the mustahabbat, those who are only doing their wajibat, compared to him, that, that appears to be darkness because they occupy a higher degree of spiritual excellence. Now, there are many scholars that, you know, when they look at these verses that speak about light and darkness, they're tempted to interpret them as purely metaphorical. However, some ulama have said that no, Light and darkness, the, the, when Allah speaks about light, it's not just purely metaphorical or symbolical. It's actually something very real in the metaphysical uh, world, in, 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 uh, in Adam al-Malakut. And the verse that is cited is from Surah Al-Hadid, verse 19, where Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصِّدِّقُونَ وَالشُّهَدَاءَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ and those who have believed in God and his messengers, those who are in the ranks of the supporters of truth, the Siddiqun, was Shuhada, the martyrs, and the Rabbihim Lahum, Ajuruhum, Wanuruhum. 
for them, for these people who believe in God and his messengers, they'll be, they'll be in the company of Siddiqun and Shuhada. For them is their reward. Ajruhum wa nuruhum. So there are two things that are mentioned. Allah rewards the believers. He gives them reward, ajr. And reward is could be in the in the form of the, the, the bounties in paradise. But in addition to the reward, they're also given what? They're given light, which some scholars understand to mean that this increase in light allows them to occupy higher degrees in the hierarchy of God's creation. And the higher you are, when you as you move closer to God, there are less limitations. So your existence is not as confined and restricted as those who occupy the lower levels. And this is one of the reasons why people at the lower levels of, levels of Jannah existentially cannot inhabit the higher degrees of paradise because they don't have the capacity to dwell in those, those regions of God's kingdom. So, وَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ وَنُورُهُمْ So this, this, this light is something that is, it's, it's something separate. It's in addition to the reward. It's, it's a separate reality from, from the, uh, the reward. And again, just another verse. يَوْمَ تَعَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَسْعَى نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَبِأَيْمَانِهِمْ On the day you see the believing men and women, their light proceeding before them and on their right. Now, why, why does it mention specifically that there is light emanating from their right side? It's because the right side is associated with good deeds. You know, so because the, the, the book of their records was given to them on their right side, those good deeds were a source of nur. So any good deed that you do is a source of light. A hadith from Imam Sadiq, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ لَيَزْهَرُ نُورُهُ لِأَهْلِ السَّمَاءِ كَمَا تَزْهَرُ نُجُومُ السَّمَاءِ لِأَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ The light of a believer. The light, the Imam says, the light of a believer illuminates for the dwellers, for the inhabitants of the heavens, the way the stars of the heavens illuminate for the dwellers of the earth. But we're not able to perceive that because we are, we occupy this material world. But because angels, you know, they're able to move between, they're able to kind of oscillate between alamu dunya and alamu mulk and alamu malakut, they they see the essence and the reality of, uh, of believers. So, وَمَا يَسْتَوِ الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرِ That the blind cannot be com uh, compared to those who see. Darkness cannot be compared to light. وَلَا الظُّلُمَاتُ وَالنُّورِ وَلَا الظُّلُمَاتُ وَلَا النُّورِ وَلَا الظِّلُّ وَلَا الْحَرُورِ Nor the shade and the heat. Now, of course, this is likely a reference to paradise and shade, of course, is uh, one of the amenities of paradise and shade, especially in the context of the Arabian culture, it was seen as, you know, the, the ultimate uh, experience of comfort. You can imagine traveling through, through the deserts under the, the oppressive heat of the sun Shade is, is security, it's safety, it's, it's relaxation, it's ease. And that's the ultimate uh, outcome of faith and connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you connect to your Lord, when you connect to your creator, you are moving in the direction of absolute eternal prosperity. And when you move away from your creator, and you choose other paths, you're heading towards your own destruction. Harur. Harur, it, it refers to the intense heat 
heat, which is of course a reference to Jahannam. And of course, this these are all really projections of, of the human soul, as I've mentioned many times. There is no Jannah without Ahlul Jannah. There is no Jahannam without the people of Jahannam, you know, because the hearts, the, the hearts of the kuffar are the fuel of Jahannam. And the hearts of the mu'mineen are, are the building blocks and uh, they're, they're the source of the, uh, the paradisal delights. Verse number 22. وَمَا الْأَحْيَاءُ وَلَا الْأَمْوَاتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسْمِعُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ And not equal are the living and the dead. So you see this sharp contrast that those who reject God, who reject the divine message, they are described as blind, as, as people of darkness, as, as people who are moving towards their own destruction. The believers are described as those who have basira, who can see, those who are in a state of nur, those who are moving towards absolute prosperity, unending eternal prosperity. And then Allah says that the, the living cannot be compared to the dead. They're not equal to the dead. Indeed, God causes to hear whom he wills. And this is also a, uh, a signal of hope that no matter how far you move away, even if you are even if you are spiritually deaf, if there is an even an iota of goodness in you, if there is even a small inclination towards the truth, God has the ability to make you hear. God causes to hear whom he wills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate physician who can remedy the ailments of the heart. So even if someone is deaf, if there is some desire in them to know the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate that for them. God causes, inna Allah yusmi'u ma yasha. God causes to hear whom he wills. Wa ma anta bimusmi'in man fil qubur. But you cannot make hear those in the graves. Now, of course, this does not mean that the amwat, that the dead are completely oblivious and unaware of the affairs of the living. Of course, as a general rule of thumb, when people die, there is a barzakh between them and the living. Right? There's a barzakh between them. And, and of course, it's important to note that we have many, we have many narrations that affirm that there are some instances where the, the dead are aware of the affairs of the living. They can hear the living. The Battle of Badr, for example, is an example, is a prime example of this, where the Prophet addresses some of the, the chiefs, the, uh, the main figures who opposed him and who fought him, the likes of, uh, of Abu Jahad, for example, where the Prophet says to them that did you find... Did you not find the promise of God? I, I have found the promise of God to be true. Have you also found the promise of God to be true? And when the prophet, you know, some of the companions of the prophet, you know, they were confused. They said, Ya Rasulullah, are you speaking to the dead? And the prophet says that you, you are not able to hear me better than they can hear you. So we have narrations that mention that there are instances where the, the dead can hear the people, the, those who are in their graves, there are moments where they're able to perceive, but when Allah says وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ of course, this connection between the, the dead and the living can only be facilitated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that no, no one can independently create that connection. This is entirely uh, in the hands of God. Verse number 23. In anta illa nadir. That's the reality of faith and rejection of faith. Of iman and kufr. 
And of course, when the prophet propagates his message, there are going to be different reactions. And the Prophet ﷺ, because he's rahmatan lil alameen, he cares about people. He cares about their dunya and he cares even more about their akhirah. And the Prophet would be troubled, he would be distressed when he sees the likes of Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan arrogantly turning away from the truth, refusing to humble themselves before Allah, really missing out on a, a good life. You know, Rasulullah was really offering them a, a, a good life and a good hereafter, and an even better hereafter. The Prophet felt so much pain when he would see the, the Meccans and the disbelievers in their state of misguidance and rebellion. But the Prophet in Anta Illa Nadir, Allah tells, reminds the Prophet time and time again that you're only a warner. You are, your job is to deliver the message. I will not hold you accountable for their reaction to your message. And when we, you know, even when we do da'wah, when we try to educate people about Islam, we shouldn't get frustrated that, you know, you know, how come, you know, no one's interested in, in Islam? Why is it that, you know, people are turning away? It's not your job. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the one who guides. So in, in anta illa nadir, O Muhammad, you are nothing but a warner. And of course, during the Meccan period, there was a lot more warning than, than offering glad tidings because it was such a morally depraved society that it warranted more verses relating to divine threats of punishment than uh, divine promises of reward. I mean, you're talking about a society that was literally burying female inf infants alive, a society where the gap between the rich and poor was so egregious that you have the likes of Abu Sufyan who was a shark lender in Mecca who would uh, issue loans under the condition that he's paid back a thousand percent in interest. I mean, you, you, you think you have high interest loans? This was, this was Meccan society. You know, human uh, women were commodified. There were only a handful of people who knew how to read and write. Bloodshed. You, tribes would would bicker and they would be locked in in ceaseless warfare and bloodshed for for decades and generations human life had no sanctity so of course the prophet is going to employ a tone of of warning and a threat of divine punishment that you people need to straighten up because you're not living like human beings so the tone of the prophetic message in Mecca was, was one of, of warning. You know, we have uh, wa'ad and wa'id. Wa'id means promise of reward. Wa'id is, is threat of punishment. So there was definitely a lot of that. And of course, again, as I mentioned, the prophet's mission is to deliver and to embody the message of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold the prophet responsible for Abu Lahab's behavior or Abu, Abu, Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan's insolence. That it's not, that, that's not your problem, Ya Rasulullah. Allah will deal with them. Your job is to deliver the message, is to conduct yourself in a way that reflects uh, the, the teachings and the values of, of the divine, uh, of the sacred law. In Surah 5, verse 92, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ and obey God and obey the messenger. And if you turn away, then know that upon our messenger is only to clearly convey the message. And we'll, uh, we'll conclude uh, with, uh, with this verse. 
إنا أرسلناك بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا Indeed, we have sent you with the truth, with the truth, with the absolute truth, the truth about what happened in the past, the truth about the story of Musa, about who Jesus was, whether he was crucified or not, what happens after death, what is the purpose of human life. Inna arsalnaka bil We sent you with the truth. Bashiran wa nadira. Now the Prophet is not all doom and gloom in his message. He also gives glad tidings that if you forge a relationship with your Lord, with your Creator, if you obey Him, the best is yet to come. When Adir and the Prophet's a warner that if you wish to live your life in a way where Allah is not even in the equation, He's not even a variable in, in your calculus, then you have to face the consequences. You have to live with those, with those, uh, with those consequences. And this is really a very beautiful part of the verse. And there was no nation, but that there had passed within it a warner. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that and the Quran is uh, is very careful with its uh, with its words. Allah says that He has sent a warner to every ummah. Allah has sent one hundred twenty four thousand prophets according to traditions. Allah didn't send prophets to every single village on earth throughout human history. That's not necessary. What is necessary, his justice dictates that a guide is sent to the major metropolitan cities around the world. For example, Musa is sent where? He's sent to uh, Fir'aun, major city. All of the major cities throughout history received a nadir. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did send some prophets to remote areas, but there is not a single major city, an ummah. So he sends guides to the major metropolitan cities which exercise economic social and religious influence over the surrounding regions. With the Prophet, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't send one Prophet to Medina and then another Prophet to Mecca and another another Prophet to Ta'if. Where does Allah send His final messenger? To Mecca, which is Ummul Qura, which is the most important city in Arabia. When Allah sends Prophets, He sends them to the hearts of civilization, to the most important cities, to the to the, to the metropolis regions. Why? So the message can be amplified. Because if it reaches those regions, it will radiate to the you know the suburbs or to the the, the neighboring regions. And this is also an important lesson for us that if we want Islam to spread, if we want the pure Islam of Ahlul Bayt to spread, we need to have a presence in the major cities around the world. There needs to be a, an Islamic center for learning. There needs to be a scholar in you know, DC, in New York, in, in uh, for example, uh, in Madrid, in, uh, in all of the, the major cities around the world, in, in Cairo, and you name it. Because this was how Allah dispatched and deployed His messengers. They went to the, the most important cities, the cultural centers, the intellectual capitals of the world. And, and then it's upon the people the followers of those prophets to take that message and spread it 
to the neighboring region. So the Prophet of Islam was sent to Mecca. He wasn't just sent to this remote village. He was sent to the heart of Arabia, to Ummul Qura. With that, we will uh, conclude our discussion for tonight. Uh, if there are any questions or comments, you can uh, you can present them uh, at this time. Wassalamu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Oh, Sheikh. So, uh, the this Warner, um, is that something that would even ulama of say today's time or since the time of the Imams be considered uh, Warners in this sense? So, if you, so the, the the verse seems to be speaking about the past, that the, the messenger, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa and all of the the nations before him received uh, received some divine guidance in the form of enlightened people who were who were divinely uh, designated now so this verse it doesn't seem to uh, to be to be referring to today of course we have the the 12th Imam in our midst but but because of the word khala uh, which means you know uh, and there was no nation but 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 that there had passed, Within it, a warner. So the verse, this specific verse, sp- uh, speaking to the the divine policy, the Sunnah of Allah, in sending uh, warners to uh, to every ummah on earth uh, throughout uh, throughout time, from the time of Adam until the the final prophet. And re- and now, you know, in our in current times, especially during the Ghaiba, now it's upon us. And especially those who have, who are the bearers of the final message, the final testament, the sacred law, who are adherents to the path of Ahlul Bayt, it's our responsibility to to be those uh, those ambassadors to uh, to the rest of the world and to have a presence in those uh, those major uh, cities around the world. Thank you, Sheikh. And there is a interesting parallel between and from verses uh, nineteen to twenty-one. The verse nineteen seemed like it was uh, listing the ability to uh, talking about the ability to sense uh, the truth. Then verse twenty was talking about what that that sense leads you to notice, with the darkness and the light. Mm-hmm. And then finally, verse twenty-one is talking about the effect that it has on you. So it's like your ability to sense what you sense from it, and then what sensing it does to you. Yeah, I mean, very beautiful observation. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, when it comes to tafsir, we can't say with with one hundred percent certainty that this was uh, that that this is the case. But it seems that yeah, there is there is a type of progression where, you know, when the heart, when the eye of the heart is able to see the truth, it acts in accordance with the realization of reality. By, by believing and by doing good and, and doing good is to act in accordance with God's law. And this is what creates that, uh, you know, this luminosity in the heart. And, and as, as you mentioned, and the effect of that is, uh, is eternal bliss in the form of paradise. And one of the, the features or the amenities of paradise is, is the shade, which, which can be understood as a, as a reference to, uh, to the, the comfort, the comfort and the, uh, and the ease and the prosperity of paradise. But, but yeah, very beautiful observation. And um, for the uh, the verse you mentioned during verse 19, like this is Quran verse uh, chapter 17, verse 72. Whoever is blind in this life will be blind in the hereafter and more astray in way. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what it means to be more astray in the hereafter compared to how astray they were in this life, presumably? As I mentioned, again, we uh, when we spoke when when I spoke about uh, in the beginning of the tafsir, I mentioned that to be more astray is 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 the idea that when you when we think of dunya, there are so many limitations because really dunya is the lowest plane of existence in 
the the kingdom of God, if we want to speak of it in, in those terms. So, and there are even a hadith that speak about this, that that Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Summiyat dunya dunyan li annaha adna min kulli shay. That dunya has been called dunya because there is nothing that is lower than it. So this is a world that is characterized by limitations, by restrictions. And that's just the nature of, of the material world. Now, if so if someone is blind, so a person that's blind in, in this world, that blindness is going to, is going to be proportionate to what is available, the, 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 uh, the size of this world. So if, if someone is, I'll give you a, 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 an example. If someone is blind, but they're, they're confined to their house, it's still a loss because there are so many things in your house that you cannot enjoy because of your blindness. But if you step out into a more vast world, you step out of your house, it's an, it's an even greater loss because there, there's even more to see that you're missing out on. Does that make sense? So blindness in the hereafter is even worse because there are less restrictions and there's more potential to see, but your heart, but the heart is blind. Does that make sense? A, a bit. So I guess I'm, I'm maybe hearing two possible different uh, understandings. One is that again, again I, and I, I want to emphasize that that this is this is me uh, thinking out loud. I, I don't want I don't want you to think that I'm giving you the end all be all answer because I haven't seen uh, a detailed discussion on this in the uh, in the tafasir. So this hasn't been uh, discussed in in any elaborate detail. Sure. So, so I guess I'm seeing two possible uh, two possible understandings from what you're saying. One, one is that uh, the potential of you're, you're missing out on an even greater potential of what you could have had uh, in the next world. That's kind of one understanding. And the other potential understanding is that in this world, you can only travel in two dimensions. You're going like on the ground, you're in two dimensions of the surface. But if you had this third dimension, like say you're swimming in the ocean, yeah. Uh, you have up and down that you can move in as well. And if you're kind of wandering blindly with an additional dimension, you can get even more lost compared to where other people are supposed to be. True. And, and that's, that's one possibility. And also, you know, one of the reasons why, and this is a discussion that, that uh, theologians have, is that one of the reasons why Jahannam exists is you know Jahannam is in many ways, and you have the the angels of Jahannam. They're there to essentially confine these dark souls, these individuals, from causing damage to other, to other creatures of God. Because in that world, because there are less restrictions in that world, that means the the capacity for harm against others is even greater because this the ability of the soul is stronger see in, in another example that i'll give you if someone is a fornicator in uh in in dunya there's a limit to how much you can fornicate because of the physical limitations but if you remove those limitations the your capacity for destruction is even greater. Do you understand what I mean? So, so because that world is less restriction restricted, those who have corrupt souls are even more of a danger to themselves and uh, and uh, and others. So they necessarily have to be confined to Jahannam. Uh, you uh, you make uh, Jahannam sound a bit like a uh, jail for supervillains. To a certain extent, it is. It is. I mean, it, it, it. You know that that's one of the reasons. And and you see, even in the interaction between the people of Jahannam themselves, they're also, uh, you know, they they degrade each other. It's a very unpleasant place to be. You know, 
that they have to be controlled. They're almost like beasts that if they're, if they're let loose, they, they could cause a, uh, a great deal of, uh, of harm. But that's the only place that they can, they can inhabit because nothing else, nowhere else, there's nowhere else in God's kingdom that is conducive for their souls. And in this jail, there is some kind of burning of sins or penitence, some, some path that people seem to gradually be re- rising higher in rank over time and eventually leaving Jahannam. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the example that I, the analogy that I, that I also give uh, about Jahannam is that you can see it as a, as a spiritual hospital. And you, all, you can also see it as a, as a spiritual uh, prison. So it really depends on what angle you want to look at it. The psychiatric ward. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 you, if you want to look at it that way. But, but you understand my point that yes. that, well, that could be one of the, uh, the, uh, the reasons why that they're even more astray in the, uh, in the hereafter because there are less limitations and, and their capacity to act out their evil actions is, uh, is much more intensified. Yeah, well, one th- interesting thing that you're kind of highlighting here is that even in the next world, uh, people have agency and they have the ability to take actions and perform a lot of things if somebody is not actively trying to prevent them from it. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting. And uh, another a question, uh, could you talk a little about the uh, Illuminationist School of Philosophy that uh, you mentioned and uh, what it was kind of, uh, what was the alternative to it that people had practiced before? Because it's not quite clear what part is that, what part ref- ref- refers to this philosophy in particular? So, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, there, there are some, so, so his, his idea, and, and it, it's a very detailed discussion that it, it honestly requires some background in, in, uh, in philosophy. And I, I'm afraid that a lot of our, our listeners don't have that, uh, that background. But in, in a nutshell, as I indicated, that, that everything in creation possesses a de- degree of light. And that degree of light determines their, their place in that, in that hierarchy. Some of God's creatures, namely those who don't possess free will, they have a fixed degree of light. And by the way, everything has new will. And that, that's even true from a, uh, from a, from a physics perspective. Uh, everything is essentially boils down to, uh, to energy. So, so, you have, so, you're, so you have this hierarchy. And the only beings that, can, that have mobility in this, this hierarchy are those beings that have been granted free will, human beings and jinn. <clears throat> so... So he was really the first one to kind of articulate this in, in, in that way and, and have really all and understand morality and, and really everything in creation in relation to this, uh, these concepts of, of light and darkness. So spirituality is essentially a quest to accumulate spiritual light. And corruption is basically the extinguishing of, of, uh, of that light and, and, and God's, and, and God's creation, everything in creation possesses light and, you know, it's, it's place in God's creation. And, and th- those who have higher, the beings that have higher, more awareness, higher consciousness, uh, they have, you know, perhaps higher degrees of, uh, of light. Now there are some who completely reject this uh, philosophy, and they say, "No, you know, it's not, you know, it's not meant to be uh, taken literally." There are some who say that light is uh, simply metaphorical and, and figurative. So, uh, so that that's basically, in a nutshell, what uh, the uh, the theory uh, posits. And and you can read more about it. Uh, online, it's uh, there's a lot of information about it, but just as it relates to our discussion, that's that's the gist of it. 